So obviously, Scott, I've known you a long time. Um, rumor has it, you know, I was the best college roommate ever. I probably inspired most of the great things you've done in life. I mean, one could argue. I mean, you're definitely one of my top two college roommates. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, you know, I guess, you know, curious, I mean, what made you decide, I mean, obviously you're in business, uh, you have two running stores, very mm -hmm. successful running stores outside the Philadelphia area. Uh, but what made you decide to go the, I guess, more entrepreneurial way? I mean, it's obviously a riskier way. Uh, to to make a living, um, did you grow up just with like the idea that it was better to work for yourself, or you know what really led you down that path? No, I mean I kind of, it was a very circuitous route. I'm a fairly risk averse person. I mean I'm sure you know this about me because we've known each other for you know a hundred years. But um, I was I was going down a very different path in life, and um, I was uh, studying to become a, a clinical psychologist. I did practice in that field for a while. Um, and I liked it a lot. I was working on my doctorate and um, was very miserable with the program I was in and was looking to transfer uh, to a different program that I kind of lined up with more as far as, um, you know, the philosophy. Uh, at the time, I was uh, coaching at Villanova and also working at the Bryn Mawr Running Company outside of Philadelphia. And I needed a break from school. I've been going to school for a long time and I was thinking, <laughs> What can I do to kind of progress forward while I take a year off from school? It's like, oh, you know, my hometown is really underserved in running. So I, I talked to my boss at Bryn Mawr Running Company. I said, what do you think of this idea? How about I open a store there and then I'll, you know, I'll manage it and go back to school. And he's like, yeah, it's a great idea. I mean, that area is underserved. So he helped me open the store and it was busy. And I enjoyed it and I, you know, I stuck with it. So it's, it was, it was not my life plan to sell uh, running footwear in my hometown, but it's great. I mean, it's a great life. Uh, I really enjoy the work that I do. I enjoy the customers, um, the staff we have is fantastic. It's just a lot of fun. So, yeah. I mean, I feel like, yeah, I think that is a pretty risky move though. I don't think that was one that would a risk averse person would have said like, Hey, let's just open a running store. <laughs> here yeah, right like I, mean, I don't feel like that it is a riskier move but where i was in life at the time i was at a place where i was pretty confident that the area could support this type of business i i mean i grew up here i know that there's a, a dense population of runners from from my high school from your high school right up the street um very active adult population we have a bunch of pharma businesses that are within you know a few miles of the store. So I knew that the population was there and they were driving a significant distance to get the service that I thought that I could provide. So it was risky, but I also at the time didn't have a family. So I had, I had money in my pocket and I wanted to kind of invest in something that I thought was a pretty surefire like success idea so yeah like a calculated risk basically yeah it was a calculated yeah. risk but i mean it was a risk but it was a calculated risk i had i had faith well so. for, for for the audience that's curious scott does own uh, north wales running company um and uh you know not only are uh are ryan and i clients but uh, we come far distances to come to the store and you know i think you know a big part about what i love about what you your you and your your staff do is that you know they're very service oriented now is that something that you know when you first opened the store that was a big part of um, you know, a big part of your mission. I mean, s s the only reason anybody would shop at a small independent retailer would be service. I mean, you can get product yeah. at this day and age, True. you can buy it, you can sit on your phone and buy, you know, running shoes, you can buy televisions, you can buy other phones on your phone. Um, service is the number one reason anybody would come to an independent retailer. Uh, so that has to be always our focus. Pricing is, is really balanced out. People, um, often believe that they're going to find a cheaper price online, but for the footwear that we carry, it is always pinned to whatever the manufacturer's price is. So when, when the shoe goes on sale, it goes on sale in my store, it goes on sale at Bryn Mawr Running Company. You know, all of, all of the local stores will, Haddonfield, will all pin our prices to whatever, you know, Hoka, Nike, Asics, whatever they're selling shoes for. You know, if Brooks changes the price, we're changing the price. Right. So we so need the only to service, service people. Yeah. Right, right. Yep. Like, and people appreciate that because it's rare. Yeah. I think our industry is the same way. I mean, it really does come down to the, the, the service component, which right is, is a much rare thing, especially because everything has become more cold yes. in the sense that like you go online, you buy something, 
uh, it doesn't have that uh, that same warm feeling of like, hey, you go into a store, you get to see people in a community. I mean, that's that's pretty cool. What's kind of interesting too, I was thinking about this, like, you know, when we ran track and cross country a hundred years ago, um, I think we it was barefoot. The track was up <laughs> both ways, if I remember correctly. Yeah, you know, Scott Ooh. Ryan still wears his varsity leather jacket, by the way. That's true. That's true. Yeah, I was going to wear my, my Nova. I'm surprised <laughs> you're not wearing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> I should have worn it for this interview. Should have. I, I want professionalism. <laughs> well, you, you kind of take a step back here just with my, on the personal life. I mean, so obviously you took a riskier move or calculus, we'll call it, like starting a running store. Like, how did you grow up in terms of like your your views on money? Did you grow up like being nervous about money? Uh, were you raised in a household where like money wasn't a big deal? I mean, how do you think how you grew up and your relationship with money has kind of like helped you with the decisions you've made as you've grown as an entrepreneur and really, you know, now have your own family? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I grew up in a family where money was something that was respected and something that you had to save. So like I was taught to save uh, young. Um, I think based on how my parents both grew up with parents who lived through the depression, my parents yeah. were really uh, instilled uh, like a savings um, concept in my head. So, you know, I had my first job at 12 or 13. I walked from the middle school to a pharmacy in town and cleaned the pharmacy a couple of days a week and walked next door with my check and had a passbook and, you know, started saving money at that point. And some of that money is what ended up funding the store. So. You know, I've had jobs here That's and amazing. there, yeah, my whole life. So, um, yeah, I'm a big, I'm a big saver. So, um, doing something that's a little riskier with with my finances, like opening a store, was 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 a, a bit of a challenge for me. But the people I talked to, I bounced the idea off of, thought that you know the risk was low, considering that it was a risk. Um, but yeah, growing up, my parents were um and still are uh like, like a great example of you know all right you you spend money on important things but you know save save for a rainy day save to take care of your family you know and just make sure you make good good thoughtful decisions so when when you start the school store did you did you have any help or was it was it all on your own steam yeah when i first opened i had two investors i had the owner of brinmar running company bob schwelm he's uh my idol in the industry, uh, one of the best people I've ever met, and another guy that I really look up to, my father. He was getting ready to retire from his job, and I really wanted uh, a reason to see him all the time. So I asked those two to kind of be my partners uh, right off the bat, and um, bought them both out very quickly. But uh, my dad and I went in and bought the the property together. So we're 50-50 owners on the property. And I own 100% of the business. So yeah, I, I had investors right off the bat. Um, we had an agreement on how the buyout would look, and you know, I wanted. I came in a quite a bit ahead of schedule with the buyout because I was interested in just getting it done. And they were both very happy with that. And you know, I'm very fortunate that they uh, believed in in the idea and and helped me out where they did. Just don't stiff your dad on those rental checks. That would be good. <laughs> Can't do that. He's a great, <laughs> he's a great property manager, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'm very, I'm very lucky. I mean, not everybody gets the opportunity to spend quality time with a parent in the, in the business like you guys do and I do. So um, even though my dad doesn't do anything day to day with the actual business itself, he does with the property and I get to see him all the time. So I'm very lucky and it, it brings a smile to my face. Uh, just to kind of see him roll in and, and do his thing. Sounds like Chris, he doesn't do anything day to day with the business. <laughs> <laughs> I think in the mafia, they call that, they call that a no show job. <laughs> yeah. So Scott, I mean, I, you know, it's been really great getting to know you over the years and uh, you know, I know you and Ryan have always been close, but you know, one of the things I, I really enjoy hearing about is, you know, you work a lot, but you know, you also get to enjoy your life too. I mean, you get to spend a lot of time with your kids. And I know that uh, you, you did something this past summer that was uh, that was pretty amazing. Tell us a little about that. Oh, yeah, we bought a little uh, 100 year old uh, Spartan cabin not too far away from here. And um, yeah, it's been a dream of my wife and I is to have like kind of a cabin in the woods. And we thought we would go further out in like the Poconos, but we found an opportunity fairly close by. And for my schedule, um, it makes a lot of sense because I don't often have two days off in a row. Uh, but we wanted somewhere that we could access quickly and spend spend some quality time just disconnected with the kids, you know, 
just out in the woods, fishing, hiking, uh, having campfires, and just really just enjoying some quality time together. It's the coolest thing I've ever bought myself. If you if you saw it, you'd be like, why would you ever purchase this? But um, <laughs> But just the location and the, the picnic table out front, the peacefulness of it really is something that uh, I value. Yeah, I'm curious about that too. I mean, it's funny, um, you know, you and I were roommates and our, our other roommate uh, from college as well. We were all, all three of us are runners, me, you and Dean Smith. Uh, and we all ended up taking the entrepreneurial track, uh, no pun intended, we're on track. Do you think there's a connection there between, you know, the independence? I mean, running obviously is a team sport, but it's kind of not a team sport. It's kind of interesting mm -hmm. about it. Do you think that there's something that, you know, from running uh, correlates over to being an entrepreneur was a desire to be an entrepreneur? Because you're an entrepreneur, you are independent. You have to make a lot more decisions. You're not really relying on anyone else. Do you think that correlates a bit with, uh, you know, with your time being a runner? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And no, I think it really does. I think in order to be um, an athlete, you know, a runner, a swimmer, even a wrestler, like sports where you're out there by yourself, you learn a lot about you know, about life. So you're having a bad day out on the cross country course. Your coach can't sub you out. I, t I, I say this to a lot of uh, people in the store when we're talking about the importance of running. If you have a bad day, you have to either make the decision to continue to have a bad day in front of everybody and suck it up and really learn something about yourself, how to push through hard times um, or not, you could quit. And I think at any given cross country meet, you don't see kids dropping out. They fight through it and then they learn to be more independent. You know, each time that happens and you're having a rough one, you go out, you pick yourself up and you keep going. And I think you see a lot of, of runners who are self-starters, especially if you grew up in the sport and competed uh, at, you know, at, at the college level, for example, just for the three of us. But yeah, it definitely has a huge correlation with with what we do and being a, a you know I think a self motivated person because it it does take a lot to you know get up in the morning and be like all right I gotta you know dream it all up again and get out there and and keep pushing. Well, I think it is kind of like you know being a business owner, being an entrepreneur is like being on an island. No one cares, and I think that's kind of like running too. When you're a long distance runner, no one cares. Yep. <laughs> no one yeah, comes. Yeah. No one yeah. comes to our meets. Yeah, <laughs> no one, no. Yeah. You really have to do it for the own self satisfaction, um, sure. and I think that yeah. there's some truth to that. You really, it is, it is kind of a lonely sport to some extent, um, and I think being an entrepreneur is kind of like it is, it's kind of a lonely venture as well. There's days where I come home and I'm like, gosh, I can't do it anymore. I wish I worked for somebody else so I could leave work at work, because work follows me home. You know, I mean, everybody at, on staff can get a hold of me at any time, and and if there's a problem, I I'm the one that has to fix it. That being said, the good days are so much better, you know, because you really see, you know, you see people along their fitness journey. You see people who, you know, have a goal and then they come in and tell you that they achieved it. It's a really fascinating job. Um, sure, there's bumps and there's times where you you wish you worked for somebody else so that they have, you know, all the burden on their shoulders. But I think part of the reason why we're the way we are is is the sport that we chose growing up and and what we learn from that sport and the coaches and, and the teammates we had along the way. Yeah, definitely camaraderie. Camaraderie is a big oh, yeah. one, I think, for, for sure. sure. But yeah, on, you know, on that vein, you know, we were, t we, we were talking about this before we got started. Um, you know, you're, you have, you're responsible for everything. Like, you have to figure it out. And I think, you know, a really trying time for you was, was during the pandemic. And you kind of had to figure out how to navigate that, you know, for a guy who's risk adverse. You know, you oh. took some, you made some pretty bold steps there. And, uh, you know, I'd like to hear more about that. Sure. I mean, when the pandemic first you know, came, came about, we, we had to close and, um, you know, we were closed for a while. It was a scary time. Like somebody comes and says, you can't open your business. And I'm wondering like, Hey, can we, can we do this on my wife's salary? And I'm looking at her salary. I'm like, we can, we just have to make some changes. She, she's a very successful, uh, you know, person in her field as well. And I'm very proud of her, but I I'm used to being the person that you know, that I am and providing the things that I provide for our family. So it was really scary. Um, but we had to make some really good changes for the business. We, you know, developed our online store. I had to ask a lot of questions like, what are we allowed to do? What aren't we allowed to do? Um, and then once, once we started rolling, I decided to make some, to lean into a few things that I knew my competitors weren't doing. So I, you know, I stocked a lot of stuff heavier that I saw trends coming towards. We saw a lot of people quit the gym 
begin walking. Our population of customers shifted from, you know, younger to middle age to encompassing seniors who really appreciate service a lot more. So we we saw a lot of people who weren't going back to the gym, but wanted to stay fit. They were either had a home gym or they were out walking and running. So we changed the colors that we carried. We changed some of the styles that we carried. We added things to our assortment. And, um, and I bought a little more aggressively to make sure that we had something for everybody that walked in the door. So now that um, you have know, gone through the pandemic you mm -hmm. survived a lot of, uh, ups and downs as a business owner. I mean, you know, your bona fide success, according to Chris, so oh, I don't know if that means anything yeah. or not. No. But <laughs> what what keeps you up at night now? Like, what's one thing that you think more than anything else uh, concerns you the most? I'm very picky with who we bring aboard, and um, doesn't seem like there's as many people that are willing to work as much right now. So we've we've had um, we're always a little short because I'm picky, but the people we have are so good, and I need to maintain that because that's what our customers have come to expect. Anybody that walks in the store knows that they're gonna get great service and I need to constantly have a pipeline of people. So I am concerned just because we've seen a slight uh, dip in applications, but I'm always curious, like, all right, when's the next great person gonna walk in the door that I can just pitch a job to? So well, Chris is ready to change careers, but no, it's a great point. I mean, I think like, you know, number one, there's a big labor shortage going on right now in the US and I think that's, that's a big problem and not a lot of talk around that, just how hard it is to find good people. Um, and especially your business. I mean, you go into your store, it's like Scott's the mayor. If you've ever been in there before, <laughs> it's like people come in, they come up, he's like shaking hands, he's kissing babies. I mean, it's like, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's amazing when you walk into your running store um, and you do feel that real community based type of experience, which it's, it's rare, right? You don't, you don't yeah. find that very often these days, especially, you know, coming into a small town like North Wales and, mm -hmm. um, you know, having that kind of that feeling of like everybody in the store, you know, them really well, they know all the people walking in. It's, 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 yeah. it's a really cool experience. Um, and I think it's hard to replicate that to your point. I think now more than ever, because it's so hard to find people and then find people with that real intangible, like emotional intelligence, which is so hard to find, right? I yeah. think it's, I think even more rare. Um, I can see that being a huge, huge challenge, but, uh, but you've, the way you've done it is, it's pretty, pretty magnificent. And I think it's one of those things where you have to like experience it. Um, and it's kind of like, I would say your strongest skill. I don't know if you feel that way more than anything else is just your people skills. Cause I, th I think, you know, that was the thing I took away when I did come to your store is just your ability to, to connect with people, which is, I think is really rare, but I almost feel like that's like, if someone's to say to, to run a really successful shoe store. You've got to have really good people skills <laughs> would be my takeaway from what your, you know, what your success has been. I mean, the, the way that, that we hire, um, if I'm interviewing somebody, I don't structure the interview in looking for the answers to their questions, but more so I'm trying, I'm repeating the same question in my head. Like when, when I'm talking to a, a potential coworker, I'm, I'm asking them, you know, Hey, what, what's your interest in the field or what are you looking to do or what are you looking to get out of this job? But really I'm asking myself in my head, would I want this person to fit my mom for shoes? <laughs> so I'm asking like, would I feel comfortable sending a, a family member, a loved one into the store and having this person be the face of my business? Yes. And when, when somebody that's valued comes in, because every customer is somebody's brother, somebody's dad, somebody's child, like they deserve to be, taken care of at a high level. And so in my head, I may be asking them a question, but I'm seeing how they're reacting and seeing what kind of person they are. You can't teach patience and you can't teach kindness. The person's either patient or kind at this point, right? So I want to see how that comes across. And is that somebody that I want to be the face of the business? It's so. a great point. Is that intangible? Is that, it's almost like you're, you're looking for vibe. You're looking for the vibe. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. what it really is, right? It's not like yeah. you can't measure EQ. Yeah. No, you, you can't. But it's a feeling. Yeah. I'm looking at people and saying, hey, look, is this person going to make me step my game up? I read somewhere that you're like, you're most like the people, the five people you spend the most time with, right? So I'm like, well, what five people would I surround myself with that are better so that they can kind of pull me up, <laughs> make me step my game up, you know? That's why you don't feel my calls ever. I get it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh gosh, not yeah, him yeah. again. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, it's such a great point. And it's, it's just one of those 
it's more of a feeling than you could say, put something down on a piece of paper or like, I, and I know that too. I, I think it's instinctual when you talk to somebody, you either, you'll like them or you don't like them. You don't know why, but you know, they have that, that gives you that certain feeling of like, yes, like I, I yeah. get the way they make me feel. If they can make my customers feel that way uh, in a good way, then, then, you know, you, you got the right person, but that's, that's such a great point. Yeah. It is our most valuable commodity is, is the staff. I mean, they're the most important thing I have in the store. They're more important than the shoes. The shoes come and go, but I want, I want people that I work with. I want, you know, the people that I surround myself with, but that are also the face of the business just to be great people. And we're really lucky because they are. Yeah. Um, I've been very fortunate over the, the years that I've had the store to have great people. And that is literally the most important thing. And that's what we have. And I'm, I'm very thankful, very happy with that. Yeah. I mean, every, every time I walk in the store, you know, every person I've worked with different people at, at various times and they're always very engaging, you know, they're very knowledgeable, but you know, it's always like a nice conversation. Like I always feel like I'm in good hands. Like you've really done a, a great job with that, Scott. It, it's awesome. Thanks. Amazing Thanks. experience. I mean, yeah. Well, and also you, you create that environment too, right? You attract what you create. So I think that's, that's a big part of it. Um, and, and I'm curious, like now that we're, I guess we're, we're slightly middle-aged. <laughs> you could say. We're on the back end of that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was yeah. being generous when I said that. Yeah. Yeah. I think you are. You know, what's something that, that you used to believe that isn't true anymore that you thought was true that now you actually don't think is true through I guess we'll call it life experience. I think coming from the hardworking mentality, like I used to feel like, oh, if I'm not there hundred percent of the time, everything's going to fall apart. The whole house of cards is going to fall down, but yeah. that's not how you go through life, you know? And, and for me learning to let go a little bit has been very valuable and spending the, the time that I get to spend with my wife and kids is like yeah. it's paramount. Yeah. So like I structure work around that. Whereas before it was, you know, pulling my hair out because I'm not there and, and making sure everything's done exactly the way I want. Um, I have to trust my staff. I hire great people. So I have to like, let them do their thing, you know, let them, you know, run the show sometimes. And, and I have to accept that I can't do everything all the time myself. And, and that was a big learning uh, moment and curve for me. I think that's totally a runner's mentality too, actually. Yeah. The yep. perfectionism. Yep. Who's doing one more, uh, you know, lap or loop than I'm doing? Yeah. Who's doing one more set that I'm not doing? Right, that, that goes back to I think that runner mentality of like, you don't want anyone to outwork you. And I think that was definitely the way we did things back in the day. And I think I remember distinctly like, if someone had a better workout than you, you you probably weren't happy. No, absolutely not. I mean, and you you in our sport, you would see value in work. So like, you know, if you have a bad one, then you go home to your dorm room and you bang out a ton of pushups and you're, you know, just doing stuff in, in you know, that, that you thought would, would elevate the level. And, and in business, it is very similar. There are, you, you can, I could work more, right. And I could see an incremental increase in business, but life value wise, that's, it's that incremental increase at this time isn't it worth it. Well, I'll bring that back to track too. where our, our coach, the great Jim Tuppany, mm -hmm. God rest his soul, um, used to say your ass was going to fall off. Yep. And, you know, he was very big on not outworking because it's like it's a, you know, it's, it's a proverbial, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Right. And you're right. It was actually harder to be like, I'm not going to go and run another quarter at a faster pace yeah. and crush it now because then the race came and you would literally be tired. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Like, the, the, the hardest discipline when you get a bunch of like type A people competing is actually to get them to to actually work out less and to dial it back, which ironically ends up being the better strategy. Yep. I mean, he was he was a great uh, coach, but a great like teacher of life lessons. I remember one time I was sitting in his office and I used to like go and in between classes or in between going to practice in the training room or whatever. I would go and just like sit in the chair that was next to his desk and be like, what are you doing here? I'm like, nothing. And I would just wait. Yeah. And then every now and then he would just like blurt out some sort of, you know, bit of wisdom. And one of the things he told me, he said, Scott, the most important thing you're going to learn in life is, you know, which levers work and which ones are for show. 
And I said, well, you know, like, and I've thought about that a lot, you know, just as, <laughs> as, as a great, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. He used to just drop these knowledge bombs and just what a, what a fascinating person to teach us like, Hey, hard work is valuable, but you can overcook it. Which is incredible because I'd say at 75, he probably had a more relevant or more like avant-garde viewpoint about running than any other coach out there. He, he was much smarter about how hard we trained. Yep. Um, that's cr it's crazy to think he was 75, but he was completely re relatable. Mm -hmm. um, and he was his foresight in terms of like training, I think was some of the best. I don't, I know they've gotten way more modern with their training today, but I think his, maybe his old school methods were actually better. Is probably a better way to put it. I think um, he was very far ahead of his time as far as conceptually what he was doing. Training has, you know, taken leaps. Um, it's fascinating looking at the way that, you know, college teams and professionals train now. Um, it's way more accurate and you can really dial in each workout, each rep. But the concept of what he was doing is exactly what is being done now, just in a more fine-tuned way. Yeah, exactly. You're going back to what you were saying before. It's like, you know, you, you never remember that extra hour that you worked, but you know, you always remember that time you spent with your family or friends or doing something that you really loved. Yeah. Well, one final question for you, Scott. Sure. Um, it's an important one, probably the most important question. We like to ask a lot of our guests this same question, but if you could pick one song that the first time you heard it changed your whole perspective, how you viewed life, um, and impact you in such a way that your, your, your whole view of your whole paradigm shift, what song would that be? Well, I know you're setting me up to, to say Wonderwall and it's obviously Wonderwall, but, <laughs> uh, for your guests, we listened to a lot of Oasis in college. So, I mean, there's no other answer I could give on They'll this do. particular podcast. They'll do. I mean, there's albums that changed my perspective. I mean, I remember, I remember, um, my neighbor had accidentally gotten two copies of the Joshua tree and gave me one of them. And it it blew my mind and changed my life. And I'm obviously a huge YouTube fan. Those would change my life. But honestly, Wonderwall just is, is something that, you know, <laughs> you and I have shared and, and, uh, you know, stood on top of tables at parties and, and really enjoyed our, enjoyed There's our no time. no drinking involved at all. No, no, never. Uh, we were very serious. <laughs> I think people. now'd be a great time to hear a little duet. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want people to quit out on the podcast. <laughs> How about you? What is your, what's the song that changed your life? I'm going to say the first one was definitely Led Zeppelin to whole lot of love for sure. Bob had that on CD, Bob being my dad. Yeah. Um, and I just never heard music like that before. Uh, that was just, it was so heavy. Uh, and the, yeah, Robert Plant's voice was just so crazy to me that I remember that being just be like, wow. <laughs> it, yeah. seemed, it seemed futuristic. Uh, probably for me, you know, music's always nostalgic for me. I would probably say uh, the song Changes by David Bowie. You guys are, are picking much deeper, better songs than my joke answer. But um... <laughs> Mr. Tantino knew what was up back then. Yeah, anyway. yeah. Oh, we know. Well, thanks, man. Appreciate taking the time. Absolutely. Great to connect. And uh, thanks for doing the interview. Absolutely, boys. Thank you. Hey, hope you enjoyed episode 147, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach, you want to get a second opinion of everything you're doing financially speaking, Bob, Chris, and I now have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you with your planning and investing. This is literally what we do every single day. If you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, we'll put together for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally will go through every single aspect of your portfolio and your financial plan. No other firm out there will do this work up front. We'll go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today, whether it's an income plan for retirement, how to take Social Security, how to draw from your portfolio in the most tax-efficient manner so you don't run out of money. We'll build you a full dynamic income plan, factoring in inflation. We'll look at diversification. Markets have been extremely volatile the last couple of years. Has your portfolio been up and down? Or have you been sitting in cash, paralysis by analysis, trying to figure out what to do? We'll put together a full investment game plan tied to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, structured product, brokerage product, We'll do a deep dive of every investment you own to show how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook, 
Simply go to www.paincm.com financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review.